let YouTube do its thing. Get some people up in here, and then we're going to start this bit up. Let's get it. Haven't been live. Haven't been live, man. What up, Amber? What up, Brittany? Yo, yo, shout out everybody in the chat. Man, I, I feel like I haven't been live in, it's probably been like six months. I got, man, I know I always say this, but I got to start going live more. But the the problem is, like, I'm always getting home at, like, 8 West Coast time. So I know y'all be asleep because y'all, like, three hours ahead of me, at least most of y'all. But, I mean, if y'all want me to go live when I get off and shit, man, when I'm done with my day, I will, you know. Um, y'all let me know, man. If y'all up, you know, I'm up, you know. Y'all know I don't really care about the views and stuff like that. You know, so it's just I don't want to inconvenience y'all, if that makes sense, because it's not an inconvenience to me. Like, I, I, I stay up all night. Like, I'll go live 12 o'clock my time if I wanted to, you know. It's only 930 there. Oh, you good? You good? Y'all let me know, man. I, I'll let that be y'all decision because I will start going live more. If, you know, if it's nighttime, you know, I'll, I'll go live more for sure. Yo, yo, yo. What up, Jessica? What up, Dominic? Hey, shout out David, man. That's that's lit. As always, man, we got the drink. You know, we're going to have a good time. So um, I got some Mr. Ballin'. And then if y'all want, we can transition into some scary stuff like chills um, cause I haven't really reacted to some chills in a minute. So if y'all want, we can either keep it with Mr. Ballin or we can do chills, man. I'm gonna let y'all decide on that as well. Um, and yes, I still do family guy reactions, just not on the channel, um, on Patreon. That is exclusively on Patreon right now because, you know, Disney been fucking with our brother. You know, uh, they been trying to take your brother's channel and stuff. So, hey, man, we have to move that over on to Patreon. So, if you subscribe to Patreon, go ahead, subscribe, man. Go ahead, subscribe to Patreon. Um, there's a free child that you can, you know, test it out and everything, so on and so forth as well, man. So, but, yeah, uh, all that Family Guy stuff on Patreon, y'all. <laughs> and then Boom Dots after chills. Y'all trying to get my channel taken away. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's all good. We'll still be doing some um, some type of, like, Family Guy and Boondocks. And American Dad is just, I got to get around the the copyright because they be blocking my stuff, man. But we are going to jump into this Mr. Ballin'. This is never asked this question unless you want to D.I.E., man. D.I.E. So let's get it. Sailors are known to have know lots of hear strange that. customs while out at sea. Like some sailors believe that bananas are bad luck and so will not bring them on board their vessel, while other sailors believe it's good luck to throw one of their crew members overboard and then reel him back in before beginning a fishing trip. That somehow that will enhance your chances of catching. That's more crazy. Fish. Sailors but are fucking wild. While a lot wild. of these customs of the sea are pretty harmless and kind of goofy, there's one custom of the sea that is not at all. It is extremely serious and very, very dark. It's known simply as the delicate question. And in short, once a sailor asks this delicate question under certain circumstances, there's no going back for that crew. And today we're gonna learn about one of the most famous examples of this custom being carried out. So basically it's a setup. So if they ask that question, it's a setup. They already know what they about to do. They about to <laughs> they about to send you to the upper room. So <laughs> you hear that that question, you better skedaddle, okay? What? <laughs> In real life. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, thank you, Amber, for the, the right membership, place, man. Much love. Y'all want to support the, channel, support the channel? So if that's of interest Patreon, to you, please go memberships, through all the like even just watching the video and liking it and commenting, their man. Spelling and grammar in the comment section. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. On 
On the morning of February 6th, 1821, four young men stood on the deck of a small boat out in the Pacific Ocean. The sun was out, it was beautiful and warm, the water was crystal blue, but none of these four men were paying any attention to their surroundings. Instead, all of them were just standing there in total silence, staring at each other. Finally, one of the four men spoke up. His name was Owen Coffin, and he was 18 years old. And Owen, like the other three men, had grown up on the water. In fact, all four of these men had grown up on this small island called Nantucket, off the coast of Massachusetts, where the main industry there was whaling, which meant sailors like these four men would go out and hunt whales and slaughter them for their oil. So, from the time Owen and the rest of these men were very little, they were out on the water learning how to sail, and they were also learning the customs of the sea. And there was one custom in particular that Owen wanted to talk about right now with the other three men. So, in a very serious and hushed tone, Owen asked the question of the other three men that sailors referred to as the delicate question. And after Owen asked the so-called delicate question, the other three men, who were already very serious and just kind of standing there in silence, suddenly their eyes started to go wide and their mouths went agape. And then again, all of the men just kind of fell into total silence. The only sound they could hear was the splashing of the waves against the side of the boat. The captain of this vessel was a man named George Pollard. He was 28 years old, and he was actually Owen's older cousin. And what George wanted to say to Owen in response to his delicate question was no. But George didn't say that. Instead, he just put his hands up over his mouth and stared kind of incredulously at Owen and the other two men, who were also teenagers. Their names were George and Barzillai. And as he stared at these other three men, he realized that their answers to the delicate question was a resounding yes. They knew it had to be a yes. They had to do this. And even though George could totally override them because he was the captain and so technically in charge, he knew in this situation under this particular custom, he couldn't overrule them. And so with his hand still over his mouth, George just nodded a yes. Yes, let's go forward with this custom. And so, with a unanimous decision to move forward, Owen slowly reached down and pulled out the ship's logbook from underneath one of the seats behind him. And then he opened up the book and he flipped to the back pages of the logbook, which were totally blank, and he grabbed one of the pieces of paper and he ripped it out of the book. Then, Owen began to rip this piece of paper into strips. First, he ripped three identically long pieces of paper, and he held up all three at the same time to show the others that these are the three that are the same. And each of the three nodded their head. Yes, we see that. And then Owen reached down, he grabbed the paper again, and he ripped a fourth strip out, and this one was dramatically shorter than the other three. And so Owen held up this much shorter piece, and he showed Charles, George, and Barzilai, and again, they all kind of nodded in agreement. Yes, we see, that's the short piece. And so once the whole group was satisfied that they had their four strips, Owen took off his hat, he put all four strips inside, mixed it around, and held out his hat. It was time. The first man to reach into Owen's hat was Owen's older cousin and the captain. Hold on. If if somebody get the, like, smaller paper and they got to jump over ship or something, I'm going to be mad. Because wh why are we playing this game? Like, what possessed us to play this game? I don't want to play this game. And I'm a gambling man, okay? I love it, all right? But not with my life. Like, I'm not, <laughs> like... I don't know where this is going. I'm just saying, that's that's a wild game to be playing out in sea. Like... George, he reached in, he pulled one of the strips of paper out, closed it in his fist so he had no idea which one it was, and pulled it back and held it close to his chest. And then one by one, each of the other men did the same thing, reaching in, grabbing their strip, not looking at it, and holding it against their chest. And then once all the strips had been taken, at the exact same time, all four men extended their hands into the middle of the circle they were standing in, and they opened their hands, palm up, to reveal which strip they got. And George, Charles, and Barzilai all had the identical long pieces, and Owen, the 18-year-old, the younger cousin of the captain, the one who had ripped up the strips, he had the short strip. And immediately when his older cousin, George, saw this, he yelled out, no, let me take that one. But Owen said, no, this is customary. I want this. 
And so after a few moments of the men kind of collecting themselves and calming down, Charles then grabbed the logbook again, flipped to the back of it, pulled out another blank page, and he ripped it into strips again, except now he was only ripping them into three strips, two long that were identical and one short. And once again, as he ripped them, he held them up to show the other men to show this was a fair process. Then Charles took off his hat, put the three strips inside, and extended it to George and Barzillai. Owen was not a part of this round. And so George and Barzillai, one by one, reached in, took their strip, held it to their chest, and then Charles, he would take the last strip, he would hold it to his chest, and then once all the men had their pieces, they held their hands out into the middle of their now smaller circle, they opened their hands, palm up, and this time it would be Charles, the man who ripped up this second round, who would discover he had the short strip. And as soon as Charles saw this, he threw it on the ground and he ran to the other side of the boat and began screaming, I can't do this, I can't do it. Meanwhile, Owen, George, and Barzillai didn't even move or flinch. They just stood there waiting for Charles to calm down because they knew he knew this was a very important custom. And once you begin doing it, you can't just stop. Charles would have to come back over and play his role. And so after a few minutes of Charles still kind of calling out that he couldn't do this, he couldn't do this, tears are coming down his face, he finally wiped the tears, he calmed himself down, and he walked back over to the group, who again, they hadn't moved. George, Barzillai, and Owen, they're just standing there waiting to continue this custom. And so as Charles began coming back over, looking ready to continue, George, without even saying anything, reached down and unlatched a door on the side of the boat. He opened it up, he reached in, and he pulled out this long object that was wrapped in canvas. And then he handed this object to Charles. And then once Charles had possession of this object, Owen, the man who had first drawn the short piece of paper, said to the group, now it's time for a moment of silence, even though at this point, none of the men were talking. But still, they formed a tight circle with Charles holding this object, and they all bowed their heads, and they just stood there in total silence. And then once Owen raised his head, the other three did as well, and Owen, one by one, touched the shoulders of each of the men and reminded them that this had been a fair process. Then, without saying another word, Owen turned away from the group, he walked over to the edge of the boat, looking out over the water, he got down on his knees, he made sure his posture was good, and he looked out over the water. Owen had always loved the ocean, even though his own father had died out at sea. But this particular whaling expedition that Owen had been on, he thought went extremely well, and he was very proud of what they had all accomplished. And Owen was especially proud to be a part of this particular custom. This custom was one that so few people ever took part in, but all sailors knew about it. It was kind of like the forbidden custom. And here he was playing a central role, which really required a lot of strength. And so feeling very proud of himself, Owen, after looking out over the water for a few more moments, he bent down and put his chin on the edge of the boat, which signaled to Charles it was time. And then once Charles saw that Owen was in position, he stepped away from George and Barzillai and walked over to Owen, carrying this object wrapped in canvas. And then hey, once yo, he was what? right behind Owen, without saying a word to him, he unwrapped the object, and it was a rifle. And once the rifle was uncovered, he placed the barrel against the back of Owen's head, and then he fired a shot. What the instantly, Owen slumped to the ground, dead, and Charles kind of staggered back and fell on the deck and let out the strangled scream. He couldn't believe- Wait a- Wait one goddamn minute here. Someone tell me so- Why would you- Agree to play this game like <laughs> I just I, I I don't I don't understand y'all I really don't understand why would you agree to play this game like knowing that you are probably going to die or you're probably going to kill someone that you <laughs> are friends with like it's that that doesn't seem like a good game to me I mean it just doesn't leave what he had just done but he knew there was no other choice once they decided to do this sacred custom they had to take it to the end and so george who hold on time out there is another choice not to play the game and even if you're playing the game you're out at sea bro like nobody gonna know that you did not finish the game like or you even played the game unless you say it just take that to the grave with you
You feel me? Like, there, there is another way. Like, <laughs> look, I get it, honor and all that. But, hey, man, I'm telling you right now, you won't, what? You won't catch me playing that shit. What? You got me messed up. You think I'm just going to willingly let you just off me like that? Ha! <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> who had just witnessed the execution of his younger cousin, was deeply troubled and pained, but he too knew they had to bring this custom to the finish line, which meant That's it was crazy. George's turn to step forward and play his part. And so George walked up to his now dead younger cousin, and George pulled out a serrated knife and cut off Owen's head. And then once Owen's head was removed, he placed it on the deck so Owen's face was looking away from the other men, like he couldn't see what they were going to do. And then once the head was in place, George went back to Owen's body and began cutting him open and pulling his organs out Bro, what? and handing them to Charles and Barzillai. George also began cutting off long strips of Owen's flesh, creating sort of like fillets. And then even though there was a spot on the boat to have a fire, the three men decided they just could not wait. And before long, the only sound that could be heard on board this little boat Don't tell me they ate out at sea on the Pacific Ocean was the sound of Charles, George, and Barzillai tearing into Owen's raw flesh with their teeth. Turning yep, nope, nope, that's enough for tonight. I, I'll see y'all. I'll see y'all in six months. I don't know what, what Mr. Balling got going on, but I don't, I don't want to, I, I don't want to listen no more. I, I really don't. I don't want to listen no more. That is wow. And if you're a sailor, you you are a disgusting individual because why 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 is that a game? What how is that a game? I don't see what's fun about that. You going you going to kill one of your homies and then you going to eat them out in sea. Like I'm I'm very confused. Like I'm <laughs> like y'all. Like I'm very confused, y'all. Like someone explain this to me. Like Hail to the gnaw, bro. That's crazy. Wow. Their beards bright red with his blood. The delicate question that Owen asked the other men at the beginning of this story was one of the most feared questions amongst sailors. And it was only asked if there was a shipwreck or some sort of emergency that happened out at sea, which meant the group had almost no chance of survival. Only in those circumstances was the delicate question appropriate. And what it was, was do we draw lots to determine which one of us dies so the other can eat them Hell in no. order to have a better chance? Hey, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But if we in that situation... We all going, bro. Like we all, we all went through this. I don't give a damn if no, no. I'm not about to no, no. We all going. Look, we came together. We leave together. Okay, like we all going. We gonna wait it out. We gonna see. Cause I be damn if I let you eat me. I be damn. I don't no. Y'all got me messed up. Y'all got oh. See, this is why people don't take me nowhere, bro. Because of, like circumstances like that, bro. Like no, 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 no. I'm not eating you. You not eating me. I'm not offing you. You not offing me. No, we're off, <laughs> bro. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh God. We're all going. We're all going. We all got the same faith. We'll talk about it in heaven. We will talk about it in the upper room because y'all got me messed up. Y'all got me messed up. Fuck no. Hey, nah. Survival. And so during that first round, when Owen had drawn the short strip of paper, that determined he would be the one who was murdered and eaten. And then in the second round, when Charles drew mm -hmm. the short strip of paper, nope. that meant he would be the one to kill Owen. On February 6th, 1821, the day that Owen posed the delicate question, he and the other three men had been lost at sea for the past three months after a whale had struck the side of their whaling boat and left them adrift with almost no food and no water. There had been other men on board the Essex who had died from starvation and exposure and their bodies had been consumed by the surviving sailors until on February 6th, they were down to just these four men and no more bodies to eat, which is why they decided it was time. 
they had to ask the delicate question. 17 days after Owen sacrificed himself so the others could eat him, another boat happened to drift past the stranded Essex boat, which now only contained Charles and George. Barzillai had died of starvation five days after they killed Owen, and Barzillai had been eaten by George and Charles as well. And as this other ship passed by the Essex and they looked on board, all they saw were skeletons of the men that had died and been eaten, and Charles and George were on opposite ends of the boat, curled up in a ball, chewing on human finger bones, no, trying to bro. get the last bits of flesh off. And their bodies were totally emaciated, their hair and their beards were wild, they looked totally feral. And then when this boat actually came up alongside the Essex they and boarded to rescue Charles and Shit. George, Charles and George looked terrified. It was like they had totally lost their grip on reality. They had been lost at sea for 94 days and had consumed all of their friends. And so 94 days is crazy. I ain't gonna lie. 94 days is pretty crazy. And you're eating your homies? Like, you know, like, I still, I, look, I still ain't eating nobody. I mean, that's just me, you know, but I get it. But I don't get it. You know, like, I don't know. I can't, I, yeah, I can't do that. I can't do that. At that point, I'm, honestly, in that, in, in that situation, I'm probably just going to jump in the water. Like, I got a good seven days in me on that boat before I'm just like, you know what? <laughs> this is just what it is. <laughs> like, I'm jumping in the water. Like, I'm a, I'm a, no. <laughs> I'm taking my own. <laughs> like, no. Y'all got to be best though. You think you, I'd be damned if you go sit here <coughs> and chew on my fingers and then just have my skeleton in this boat. You got me messed up. No, I'm good. I've been going out with some diggity. You know, like, mm -mm. So it makes sense mm -mm. they might go kind of crazy. But after this crew was able to get Charles and George fed and get them water and cleaned up, they kind of regained their composure and their sanity, and they were very thankful and happy to be alive. The story of what happened to the crew of the Essex quickly spread all around the world, and in fact, it served as inspiration for Herman Melville to write his classic American novel, Moby Dick. Damn, that's crazy. Read that book and fucking On March 22nd, 1994, four people were sitting in a circle inside of a dark hotel room in England. In front of them was a homemade Ouija board. The four people in the hotel room reached out one finger each and placed that finger on a glass cup that was flipped upside down, resting in the middle of this Ouija board. After looking around at each other nervously, one of the four people began to speak out loud. They asked the room if there were any spirits with them right now, and nothing happened. The four people started to laugh at themselves for even trying to do this, when suddenly the glass cup began to move. As the four people stared at each other, trying to figure out if one of them was moving the cup on purpose, the glass cup slid all the way to the corner of the board and hey, came to a stop over the word promo yes. For his podcast, this Ouija though. board session would not only become one of the most famous Ouija board sessions of all time, but also it would have a dramatic impact on a major criminal case. What? That's crazy. Hey, Mr. Ballin, man, Mr. Ballin be having some dope ass promos, y'all. What y'all wanna do? Y'all wanna keep watching Mr. Ballin? Y'all wanna hop into some scary stuff and then come back to Mr. Ballin? Y'all, y'all let me know, man. I'll let y'all decide. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just prepare a video for just in case Mr. Ballin here. Man, that was a crazy ass story, though. I ain't gonna cap. I'm telling y'all right now, bro. Nobody eating me. And I'm not eating nobody. I'm, in late I, I'm July, like, of no cap, like I'm, I'm just not doing it, bro. I, I can't see myself doing it. <laughs> Whatever is your desire, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right, but so what we'll do, since I have this queued up, and I kind of do want to watch some chills because I haven't in a while. We gonna just hop into chills real quick. This is uh, 10 scary videos to cry yourself to sleep to. Let's jump up in it. Urban explorers from the YouTube channel Urbex Castronautica visit the historic La Plata Cemetery in Buenos Aires, Argentina. 
The cemetery was built in 1886 and is the final resting place of many notable figures. But while wandering through the huge cemetery's 12,000 tombs and vaults, the guys stumble upon a crypt that has been vandalized. Their camera captures something downright chilling. <laughs> Abandoned, bro, it's a cemetery, like. No. Mira lo que es esto. Did you see it? No? Well, neither did the guys who filmed it. You see, after posting this video to YouTube, their sharp-eyed viewers were freaked out when they noticed a creepy little pale hand pulling back into an open coffin. Now, it happened so quick that it's hard to see without brightening the footage and analyzing it frame by frame. But when the footage is converted to a negative image, the spooky little hand is a bit easier to see. Now, it's very unlikely that anyone could have crawled into that coffin to fake this. This crypt is very old and unstable, and it would be very dangerous for someone to just climb inside. So did this group of urban explorers accidentally capture proof of the pair? These foreign countries, bro. I say this every time we watch these videos, these foreign countries, bro, like... This is the shit that make me not want to travel. <laughs> like, like, to be honest with y'all, this is what makes me not want to travel because I be damned. I be damned, bro. Like, that is freaky as hell, G. Like, first of all, wouldn't be in no cemeteries, wouldn't be in no abandoned buildings or anything like that. But I just feel like a lot of these foreign countries just have a lot of, like, creepy backstories, you know? Like, they just... I don't know why. Like, they just have a lot of creepy backstories. Like, even in places in the United States have a lot of creepy backstories that you just don't know about, you know? Like... You can just be walking, just, you know, minding your own business, and then you see some goddamn shadow figure or hand popping out, and it's like, you shouldn't be there in the first place. Like, why are you there? You know? Like, this is what makes me not want to travel. I just want to stay home in my little vicinity, light my candles, you know, like, <laughs> and just chill with my cats. Like, because all that other stuff, I don't, no, I'm good, bro. Paranormal? Well, as usual... You decide. You can watch this entire video over on the YouTube channel, Urbex Castronautica. Trapped. In this next video, a man is taking a short video of a car that he's planning to sell. The vehicle belonged to his sister, who tragically passed away right inside the car over a year and a half ago. After sending the footage to a potential buyer, he gets an alert. Maybe I think different, but I, I, I need to stop that right there. Maybe I think different, but I probably wouldn't have tried to sell that car. Like, to be honest with you, like, not no sentimental reasons or anything, just solely because, like, my mom always told me, like, spirits get trapped in, like, horrible, like, situations like that. You know, like, I, I probably wouldn't have tried to sell that car to anybody because I'm not, I'm not trying to have you get hunted and I don't want anything to come back on me, like, I probably would just have put that car in the junkyard and just been like, you know what? <laughs> destroy this one, okay? Like, destroy that one. But that, I mean, that's just me. Maybe I think differently. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a scary person. I don't know, but I'm just saying. Alarming message saying he should really check the video closer. Hey, man. Here's this, uh, here's my sister's car. Just wanted to make this video so you can have a look at it. She still runs good. So, she's a little dirty. She has a lot of miles on her. But it, it can clean up nice. Here's the front. Sounds back. like someone's like crying in the back. There's some in the back. No. But. See, that's what I'm talking about, oh. bro. No. 
If you're interested, just uh, let me know what you think. Throughout the footage, the faint sound of a woman crying can be heard. The video was shared online by Dee's Dark Adventures and quickly gained nearly 500,000 views. In the video comments, many concerned viewers believe that the voice belongs to the spirit of the man's sister who passed yes. away inside the car and that her soul is still trapped, unable to move on. Nah, motorcycle see, that's mystery. Crazy, bro. No, no, in the no, city no. of Cagay and Oro in the Philippines, a motorcycle rider is driving down a busy road that is notorious for being the site of many fatal accidents. He is about to experience something that is truly bizarre. Oh shit! <laughs> hey. I don't know why that got me so bad. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've been watching a lot of Instagram reels. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of Instagram reels with motorcycles and stuff, man. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I just, I had PTSD for a second. I don't know, man. That shit got me though. That. <laughs> Rider is driving down a busy road that is notorious for being the site of many fatal accidents. He is about to experience something that is truly bizarre. Hey, shout out to him for keeping calm though. Shout out to him for keeping calm because I would have been freaking out. I would have swerved into the Someone smoke. appears to jump right into the motorcycle's path, but when the rider looks back, there's no one there. But it gets even weirder because the motorcycle rider claims that whoever this was, they didn't appear to have a face, only a strange dark blur. Now many locals believe that the rider saw the ghost of someone who passed away on the dangerous road. But if this wasn't anything supernatural, then just what happened here? Let me know what you think. What's scarier to you guys? Seeing something without a face or seeing something with a detailed face? Honestly, like, I'm taking, I'm taking the, the without the face because, like, I can't really, I can't pinpoint who you are, you know? I don't know, at least that's how I look at it. Like, you just straight from the depths of the bottom of the bottom. And I don't like that. I don't like that, you know? At least, like, if you have a face, I can be like, oh, okay, like, you was once human or something. But, like, without a face, I'm like, I don't know where you came from, bro. Like, they both scary. Don't get me wrong. They both scary. But for me personally, I think what's scarier is without a face for sure. Open house. Ready user slash realtor Sandra is recording a tour of a 1960s bungalow style home to show prospective buyers. Sandra's filming at night in order to showcase the house's interior lighting. But Hell it's no. starting to get a bit late at the creepy little cottage. Hell no. And things are you said about it was to get in what, 1960? weird. Nah, anything? No. No. Wow. It's 10 p.m. and my day was fully booked with showings of this beautiful vintage 1962. No, 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 no. Anything made in the 60s, don't go in it, bro. Don't go in it. Like, and then you got these creepy ass fucking paintings and shit back there. Like, wow. they all crooked. It's 10 p.m. and my day was fully booked with showings of this vintage 1963 bungalow. Yep, see? That's that bullshit. That's that bullshit. That's... See, I be, I be trying to tell people, man. I be trying to tell people. When you looking at a house and shit, man, you got to know when it's built, who lived there previously. You know, if someone died, committed suicide, we don't know, bro. We don't know. Especially houses in the 60s, bro. If it was built in the 60s, do not buy that damn house. Like, I look, my cap, you feel me? This is my cap, uh, personally, just mine. 
90s and up. You feel me? 90s and up. Anything after that, like, I, I don't want to look at it. I don't want to walk past it. I don't want to be on the same block as it. Why? Because it's too many years of bullshit. You don't know who ran through that house. You don't know who grandma passed in that house. You don't know what's in that backyard. Like, no, I'm good, bro. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm solid. Every story we hear, hear about houses, these damn houses has been built in the goddamn 60s and the 70s. Like, no, 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 bro. I be trying to tell people. This is not a game. Like, it's it's a science to it, bro. You too calm for me. If you don't get the hell out of there... Yeah, like, get the hell out of there, like. Sounds like someone's running? Was that her? Go ahead, do it again. Bro, what the? You're on camera. I, I dislike people. I really do. I really dislike people. Don't. I dislike people, bro. Do it again is crazy. You're on camera. Do it again. No. Like, come on, come on, P. Let's keep it a hundred here. Cause if that thing do it again, it's gonna is it's gonna do it ten times worse. I don't think you're ready for that. I'm not ready for that. So why are you tempting this entity into doing something? Why are you trying to like bait it, bro? Like, oh, you pussy, you won't do it again. You on camera, man. That entity toss your ass around that room. What you gonna do now? Now you just scared. You're just scared. You about to die, probably get possessed. I don't know, like, y'all tripping, bro. Open this door. Bro, stop, to I, I don't like people. Stop talking to the thing, just leave. Just leave, like. Putting your life on the line for what? Go ahead, open this door. For content? Like. Open this door like you did the other one. Yeah, that house creepy as shit. Come on, just move a glass or something. This lady needs help. Like, she needs a therapist. I don't know what she gets her rocks off on. But she, she sounds like a firecracker. <laughs> That's crazy, bro. Go ahead, do it again. I'm not scared. Hey, facts. Realtor to Ghost Hunter in 60 seconds is crazy. It took her all of 60 seconds to sit there and be like, Oh! <laughs> Hey, that's funny. That's facts, though. Look at this creepy ass kitchen, bro. Bro, I'm sorry. Yeah, see, 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 see. You, you, nah, nah. Don't run now, sweetheart. Don't poke the bear and then the bear come coming, okay? And now you want to run. Oh my god. Oh shit. This, this is a real ghost ghost. Like, nah. You no, you 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 wanted this. You wanted all of that. Don't 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 get scared now. Stay your ass up in there. You had a chance to leave earlier. You but now you wanted to sit here and talk to the ghost. Call the ghost a pussy. Now the ghost show itself and now you want to run out. Yeah, see? Mm -mm. That's crazy. That's crazy. Gotta be prepared. <laughs> don't ask, don't ask questions you don't want the answers to. Okay. The door suddenly swings right. open on its own, and Sandra is spooked. But she gathers her courage and rushes out to see what's going on. Great. A glass of water sitting on top of the fireplace shifts and slowly moves, as if it's being pushed by some invisible force. But things get even crazier as a smoke detector suddenly starts to beep before crashing violently to the floor. 
With that, Sandra has had enough and just gets out of there. But there's also something else that is very creepy in this video. Something that only a few viewers even notice. So again I ask, did you see it? Right before the door moves, a face in the picture right beside Sandra seems to slowly darken. Oh. And then the creepy little shadow fades away just as the door swings open. Sandra says that she's experienced several unexplained paranormal events no, in this, this home. But this mansion shit. Look at that. No, that's cr I told y'all those paintings was creepy. I told y'all. Look, I can sense some creepy shit now, okay? Like, when <laughs> you feel me? I can sense some creepy shit, which is why I don't go to certain places. I'm like, mm, no, no, something's in there. You go in there if you want to, all right? Let me know your experiences, but I can sense that shit, okay? That's, look, <laughs> that's my nigga senses tingling. It be, it be, it be here with it. It just, it be here. I be, I be, you feel me? I'm dialed in, locked in. You ain't gonna never catch me slipping with no ghosts. I'm trying to tell you, because I know, I feel it. Feels it in my bones, okay? This was the first mm -hmm. time that she finally captured it mm -hmm. on camera. That shit. We need scary videos. So if you see a scary video that you think would be great on the top five, email us at nukestop5 at gmail.com. Flicker. Reddit user Cybseb says that his mother is taking care of a young foster child at her home in England. One night, a TV is playing a cartoon in the child's bedroom, but the flickering light from the screen reveals something that the Reddit user and his mom simply can't explain. Something that is downright creepy. Baby right here? What is that? Oh, oh. Hey yo, if this baby pop Someone up. Someone seems to be seated in the chair. A small pale face illuminates in the flashing light from the TV screen. Nah, I'm good. Then the face just disappears. I'm good, bro. That's crazy. Reddit user Cyb Seb wonders if his mother's security camera accidentally captured a paranormal presence. But what do you think this is? I think it's a it's a the Fond du Lac baby. UFO. <laughs> Around 2 a.m., Florissa Bonale and her family friends are driving home to Fond du Lac, Saskatchewan, Canada. Suddenly, Florissa spots something very odd in the night sky. It, should, it looks like a, a UFO, right? That's a UFO. A Christian. Uh, so just stay right there. Look, it's just above there. Are you recording it? Yeah. <gasps> That's a UFO. You can just see it. <laughs> Y'all laughing. We're stuff. hiding on. <laughs> Look, man, I say this every time. Every time these alien videos, the U these UFO videos come out, man, I believe all of them. I believe all of them. And the only reason why I believe all of them is because when the government came out, I was like, yeah, we know about aliens and all that other stuff. I was like, okay. Every video I see, I believe it. I have my own experiences. I believe it. I believe it. And I do think that they walk among us. Like, I, I do think they walk among us. And I don't think that they look like green or blue or anything. I think they look just like us, man. I really do. I truly do. I think they look just like us, talk like us, walk like us, mate like us, like just all of it, you know? Shit, I think <laughs> there's some people I meet that I'm like, mm, you're an alien. Like, you're an alien. Like, never will talk to you again, you know? You're an alien. You're not from this world because there's just certain vibes and stuff that you kind of pick up from people. You're just like, yeah, you definitely not normal. Like, I don't know where you was born. Zion 6, I don't know, but hey, you take your ass back over there. Why you messing with me? Why you trying to talk to me, man? <laughs> Bro, you can just see it. It's like the rabbit. Just keep thing. recording it. It's totally on YouTube. It won't take five. Everyone is shocked as they witness a strange circular object with flashing lights soaring through the sky. Florissa's mother posted the video to Facebook and friends and local residents immediately began to respond that they too have seen the strange UFO. 
Eyewitness reports in the thread go all the way back to January 1990. So just what could this mysterious flying object be? Let me know what you think down in the comments. Follower Nick Perry says that late one night he was driving down the allegedly haunted Dyers Lane Road in Roseville, California. He says that he saw an ominous dark shadow figure up. Whoa, hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. That just tripped me out. All right, so I live like 45 minutes to an hour from Roseville. Um, and I go out there like all the time. Like they have some of the best malls, some of the best food and stuff. And it's just nice to get out of Nevada into California. You feel me? Because I was born and raised in California. So it's always nice going back. That just tripped me out. I won't be going to Roseville, California no more. I tell you that much because I didn't know y'all had a hunted ass road. No one told me that. I met a lot of people from Roseville and no one told me. And I know some of y'all are watching this video right now. Ain't nobody told me y'all had a hunted road. I could have been driving down this road for all I know. Man, see? See? This is that bull that I be talking about, bro. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing Here it. Here in the middle of the road. Nick believes that this dark entity followed him home and says that he now experiences terrifying paranormal activity. So back in 2022, I shared Nick's story on Nuke's Top 5, along with some of the scary footage that he had captured. Do not open that door. Do not open that door. Whatever you do, do not open that door. Where if you open this door, like I don't understand how people don't know about that. Don't open that door, bro. I don't understand how people don't know about that. Like that's like the oldest rule in the book when it comes to like paranormal stuff, bro. You hear knocking at the door, do not open that door because as soon as you open that door, you open the door for the entity to get in. It's a real thing. The entity is not in your house, but it's it's trying to get in the house. You opening the door is basically saying, hey, come on in, nigga. Like, let's have fun. You want a movie night? Like, look through the peephole. You don't see anything? Take your ass back to sleep. It'll probably go away. Like, <laughs> like it'll probably go away. Be honest with you. Like, just go to sleep. Like, it's not in your house. Like, you know, go to sleep. Light a candle. You know, shit. Read, read a little Bible verse or something. Like, just go to sleep. Like, you good. Now, in the last two years since those videos were recorded, Nick Perry has moved to a new house in a new city, but he believes that the dark entity has followed him. I just got home, and uh, as I was walking in, I heard some banging noises in here. So that's why I'm setting up the camera right now to find out, you know, <coughs> what the f it is. Max, shut up. Ain't nobody here. Nails up against the fing wall. Nick decides to leave several cameras recording when he's away from home. When he reviews his footage, he is shocked. Be like, man, fuck your crib, man. <laughs> no, that's crazy. Nick says that he's reached out to several churches and religious authorities, but no one has helped him. As of today, Nick says that he continues to experience paranormal events in and around his home. Bro, you gotta he move. shares his dark experiences over on his YouTube channel. You gotta move, bro. Mimic. Like, you gotta move. Leandro from Buenos Aires, Argentina, says that he began to experience strange, unexplained events only weeks after moving into his new home. He says that he would often discover that many of his belongings had been inexplicably moved into the house's bathroom. Leandro installed a security camera to see what's been going on. But late one night, 
he captures something more than he bargained for. There's a lot of orgies flying around too. Man's had his phone ready. So she could have that. Yeah, no. Nah. No, 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 no. No, no. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they got going on in that shower. But I don't want to be a part of it. I'll tell you that right now. I'm not going to be a part of it. I wake up and I see wrestling in the shower. The shower curtain getting hit. And I hear people cussing and stuff. I'm grabbing my cats. And I'm walking out. I'm going to a hotel. Okay? And then, in the morning, I'm calling whoever sold me the house, whoever sold me the apartment. And I'm being like, yo, I'm out. So I don't care what y'all got to do. I'll pay whatever. But I'm out. I'm out. Y'all don't, don't understand what I just saw. I just saw people tussling in my shower. I'm out. I think any sane person would be like, yeah, nah, you can't live there. Like, you can't live there. You know, I, I'm good, bro. Especially you got it on camera. Mans was punching. Whoever whoever was in there was, was getting beat up. Like, I don't want no parts of that. I can't fight a ghost. I can't shoot a ghost. Like, I don't want no part of that. None. He was... Whoever was in that shower was getting packed up. They were smoking on the ghost pack. Like, no. No. Bro. Crazy. Leandro is completely unnerved by the strange paranormal experience. He decides to check into the history of his new home for answers. He is horrified when he discovers that in the 1950s, a family of four passed away in a see, tragic see, fire on the see, very same. What I be saying? What do I be saying? Stop. What? Bro, see, I'm telling you, it's a science. It's a science, man. I got, look, I might be a madman, but man, bro, there's a method to it. There's a method to my madness. What did I just tell y'all about the last clip? You feel me? Anything in the 1960s, if it's built in the 1960s, you got to do your research, bro. Because you don't know who passed in that mug. You don't know someone committed some kind of crime, suicide, wh whatever. It don't matter. You don't know. You got to do your research. And I say this about apartments, about houses, everything. You got to ask these questions. Who was the past tenants? Who lived here? Did anything happen? Because I'm not trying to come in here and disturb what they got going on. Because now I'm coming into their space. They've been here. They've they been living here, chilling. I'm not trying to disturb them because then they're going to disturb me. And I can't be disturbed, baby. I can't. I can't be, I can't be disturbed because they disturbing is trying to get you to, you feel me? They, try, they trying to get you. So, mm-mm. <laughs> Leandro is completely unnerved by the strange paranormal experience. He decides to check into the history of his new home for answers. He is horrified when he discovers that in the 1950s, a family of four passed away in a tragic fire on the very same land where his house now sits. Another night, and Leandro has his friend Daniel over. And once again, it goes sideways. Hey, yo, what's that? Hey, yo, what's that? Nah, what was that? Hey, yo, did, what the f Nah, look at this. Look at this cheese here. Look at that. Nah, 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 nah. Somebody creeping in a white suit. Oh, no, 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 no. I would have been out after the first encounter. But that right there, 
That right there, yeah, that right there would have, mm-mm, I would have moved far, far away. I would have went and got baptized, okay? I'm throwing away all clothes, all materials that I had in that house. Y'all can keep it. That is you, baby. That's all you. Solid. I understand. Look, I'm picking up what you putting down. I get it. That's you. I'm out. I'm just close. Look, man, I'm running out there naked. Like, hey, y'all can keep everything. Everything. Like, just don't follow me. I don't know what that is, but that is crazy. That is legit insane, bro. A mysterious white figure can be seen passing no. by the window just outside no, no, Leandro's no. home. Then the item sitting on the nightstand get launched into the air by an invisible force. And Leandro and his friend Daniel jump up in shock. And now, this is when things get really strange. Because Leandro claims that worse? after this incident, the spirit that haunts his house actually began to imitate or mimic the sound of his friend Daniel's voice. Hey, that happened to me at Ghost Ranch. Esto es lo que yo, con lo que yo convivo desde hace meses. Con esto yo convivo hace meses. Siempre que grabo. Vos no sos Daniel. Vos no sos Daniel, esa no es tu voz. Vos no sos Daniel, esa no es tu voz. Yeah, ¿sí? ¿Sí? Daniel se fue hace meses del país. Vos no sos Daniel. Si querés lastimarme, salí y lastimame ahora. Ya. Come out and hurt, hurt me. Hold on, Dejame big joder. dog. Bro, you should have been out of that. Like, you should have been out of that, bro. Oh! Shit! Bro, why does your house look like a maze? <laughs> like, this is pissing me off. <laughs> like, this is pissing me off, bro. Why does your house look like a maze? You running around here, it looks like you just trapped wherever you go. You should have been left after the first one, okay? And then you gonna bring your boy into your house, and now it's getting worse. Like, come on, big dog. Like, you putting us both in danger. Like, you putting us both in danger at that point. Like, let's keep it a bean here. What the hell? Oh, I can't live. I can't Leandro says that he's had more than enough of the strange supernatural activity in his new home. But is it real? Or is it all just an elaborate hoax? You decide. Footprints. A woman named Kat lives in a remote area near the woods in Pennsylvania. One freezing cold morning around 4 a.m., Kat wakes up to find a light dusting of snow covering the ground outside. But then she notices something just outside her back door. Something truly disturbing. Good morning, guys. It is literally 5 a.m. I opened the back door to put some dry food out for the stray kitties. And there are people feet printed all over my deck in the snow. Do you see this? They start over there. And like barefoot walks up to the table. There's nothing coming up to the... Maybe there is something coming up to the door. What? And I don't see any in the yard. What is this? I see them kind of coming out of the flower bed. They stop there. I thought maybe they would have walked off through that flower bed, but I don't see anything there. It's like one straight line from out in the yard up to the door, Man, turned around to towards the table, you, and then just You're way too calm. stopped moving. That one has like one, two, three. Oh like hell six. no, look at this deformed ass foot. You're way too calm for me, bro. Like I see this, like you got two big toes? Like nah, big dog. Obviously that ain't people feet. That ain't human feet. You, what, you fucking around with the Loch Ness Monster out there, like, Slenderman out there just roaming your fucking yard, 
and you calm about it. Like, why you so calm? No, people, people irritate me, bro. People irritate me. Like, y'all niggas is crazy. Like, look at this shit. No, like, really, look, there's like, look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You got eight toes. Eight toes. Fuck you fucking with, like, frogman. Like, the, the, you got eight toes, nigga. And you calm about this. If you don't call the FBI, like, you f you found a special monster. Like, hey, this is Pokemon. You you found him, all right? This is, <laughs> like, this is a special creature, okay? Something has been found. If you don't call somebody, like, I'll call it everybody. Police, fire department. FBI shit, man. What I what? Everybody's being called. You gotta transfer me, cause we gotta figure this out. I don't know what's in my backyard. Nigga got two big toes. That's crazy, bro. Six toes. That's six. To so is that one? One, two, three, four, five. It is sixteen degrees out. I have not gone outside yet. My cat came and woke me up. Hysterical. Probably cause there was some barefoot person on the deck. I'm just more concerned about like a mental health crisis because there's no reason to be out there barefoot. Now for obvious reasons, Kat is a bit freaked out, but she's also worried that someone might be experiencing a mental health crisis and is wandering around in the freezing cold with no shoes. She calls the police, but she's reassured that no one has been reported missing or lost. And there have been no reports of trespassers or break-ins in the area. Kat is concerned, but she's done all she can and she just lets it go. No, 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 we not later, letting that go. The mysterious footprints are back. Okay, morning footprint update. <clears throat> Let me show you. This is the first time we've had snow since the initial footprint sighting. Do you see that? They're barefoot again. They're in a different spot than Look at my shadow. So those prints are in a different spot than when we had prints before. Let's go downstairs. It is seven o'clock. I've been up since 4.30. I didn't look outside. I just came up here and then I opened the window to see if any of the stray cats were coming up to the door yet because I didn't feed them yet. I don't understand why she thinks it's like a mental like person or someone that has mental issues because the feet look like goddamn ham hocks. Like I like I I just don't see the correlation. Like you can literally look at the the, the prints and be like, no, nah, that's not a person, bro. Like even people that are born with like extra toes and things like that. They footprints don't look like this. Like, look at this. We're coming up to the door yet because just, I didn't feel it. Look, I want to. Like, they look like ham hocks. Look at that. Look. Nobody's foot is curbing like that, bro. Like, let's let's keep it a bean here. Let's keep it real, bro. You have Bigfoot out here, like stalking you like what the hell also whoever fucking foot that is got a big ass foot too at least a size 13 at least like I'm gonna stay right along the side so I don't interfere those are definitely very bare human feet, but there are not six toes on these that I can tell. I don't know. No, though those are very clear toes right there. So the house next door has nobody living in it, so I'm not sure why the prince would be coming from that deck. Happy New Year. Cat purchased two security cameras to monitor the outside of her home, but the mysterious barefoot stranger hasn't returned yet so could this be something supernatural or is it something even scarier 
a real person creeping around Cat's house in the middle of the night. Heads I'm up, person. popular Chinese ghost hunter Xiao Long is back, this time investigating an abandoned school in China that is said to be extremely haunted. As his live stream audience watches, Xiao Long begins to hear unexplained noises from somewhere in the building. He's a little on edge as he goes to check out the strange sounds. What happens next is... Just watch. Why are you searching this abandoned school? <laughs> oh yeah, that nigga shit himself. Nah. Nah, that boy shit himself. I know, I look, I know when someone shit himself. Like, that boy shit himself. That boy say, ah, ah. <laughs> he didn't even, he didn't even fully hit the corner yet. Why are you in there? Let's let like why are you in there, bro? <laughs> you <laughs> why are you in there, bro? Obviously you ain't built for this life. Like I get it. Like I get it. I'm not built for this life either, bro. I'm not. But I tell you what, if you just gonna hit the corner like that and start yelling just out of out of the blue. You definitely not built for this life. You should not be in there. Like, why are you doing this to like to yourself? You gonna fuck around, have a heart attack? Nobody gonna find you in this about abandoned ass school, bro. Like, come on, man. Let's be real. <laughs> See, you didn't you didn't piss the ghost off. That was that was the ghost. Favorite little statue. Now the ghost gotta come get you, bro. Xiaolong gets the fright of his life because of a plastic statue head. But luckily, Xiaolong delivers a good old fashioned slap upside the head to put that statue back in line. But things are about to get a bit more serious and a bit more frightening. As Xiaolong explores deeper into the haunted school, this happens. should not be in there like you literally are about to have a heart attack like I, I don't think you should be in there why are you putting yourself through this trauma stop touching stuff bro A small ball inside a classroom rolls across the floor by itself, so Xiaolong chucks it out a window. But then the lights hanging from the ceiling come crashing down, almost hitting Xiaolong. Now luckily the ghost hunter made it out safe, but he's not done just yet. Inside one of the school's many rooms, he finds a dirty old mirror. And this is when his exploration takes a terrifying turn. Oh yeah, 
for sure somebody was like, yeah, I got you now. You don't even see me, big dog. I got you now. <laughs> what is how you look? It's an evil world we live in, y'all. It's an evil world we live in. What was it going to do? Oh, Tony, what? Stop looking in that mirror. Like, why you keep looking in the mirror? Obviously, it's behind you. Like, I don't want to see it behind me, and if I can't feel it behind me, like, I, bro, come on, man, come on, people, bro. You mother could be. I think it's time for you to go home. Go to your bed. You know, things flying at you. It, it, like at this point, it's not safe. It was never safe. But like, go home, bro. Take your ass home. You should not be in this school. Like, in the mirror's reflection, someone can be seen standing behind Xiao Long. But when he swings around in terror, there's no one there. After an attempt at Kicking and flailing at the invisible entity, Xiaolong finds that the reflection of the figure has disappeared. But now he spots a shadowy face peeking in from a window, and the heavy closet comes crashing down right in front of him. The activity is becoming a little too intense, so Xiaolong decides to leave and ends his live stream. You can see even more terrifying moments from this ghost hunt over on the YouTube channel, Outdoor Xiaolong. Bro was, <laughs> I'm telling you, bro got to change his pants. Because there ain't no way. There ain't no way. I, I, I know, I know. No, he shit himself. Because I would have. <laughs> what? Everything just released. Everything. <laughs> oh, man. All right. We going <laughs> to take a break from that. Uh, we gonna hop back into some Mr. Baller, man. Shout out to everybody in the chat, by the way. I seen just uh, Trey up in here, comedy, man. Shout out to you, brother. Keep doing you. Um, but we back to Mr. Ballin. This place will make you spiral into madness. Let's jump up in it. In late July of 1988, two hunters were walking up the steep mountain trail in Colorado looking for a place to set up for the day. And as they were walking, they eventually left the trail and began kind of meandering through the trees looking for a clearing. And at some point, they spotted a clearing up ahead, but in this clearing, there was this really bright white thing at the base of one of the trees. And so the two hunters, they walked up to investigate what this white thing was, and when they saw it, they both knew immediately that this was something no one was supposed to see. And so after the hunters took a mental note of where they were on the mountain, they turned around and rushed back down to town to tell authorities. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the what strange, they dark, see? and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, the next time the like button is at work, secretly sneak into their house and train their new puppy to bark at shadows and pee behind the washing machine. 
Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. On the afternoon of June 15th, 1988, a man named Keith Reinerd drove down the main street of a tiny town called Silver Plume, which is located in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. In his car was everything Keith would need to live for the next three months. Silver Plume was the kind of place that most people would just pass by on the highway without even considering stopping. It was kind of a no-name town in the middle of nowhere. In the 1800s, it had been a booming mining town. However, now all but 140 of its residents had either died or moved away. In fact, Silver Plume was considered a living ghost town because of how close it was to being totally abandoned. But this emptiness and kind of middle of nowhereness was exactly what appealed to Keith about this town. Keith was 49 years old and lived over 1,000 miles away to the east in a suburb of Chicago, Illinois. And Keith had a great life. He was married with two kids, a boy and a girl. He had a good job working for a newspaper covering high school sports, and he had a beautiful house. But for Keith, he felt like as good as his life looked on paper, it was missing something. There was one thing he had always wanted to do, but had always put off doing, and that was to write a book. And not just any book, a book that lots of people were going to read, a great American classic. That's what he wanted to make. But there was just one problem. Keith had no idea what this big book was going to be about. And that was why he had come to Silver Plume. Keith had taken a three-month leave from his job and left his wife and his kids and the city all behind to come out to this town to hopefully, in this new, peaceful, quiet environment, find the inspiration he really needed to not only discover what this book would be about, but to sit down and actually write it. Keith's wife had not been happy about this plan, him kind of being gone for three months, not providing any income, not helping with the kids but she could tell Keith really felt like he needed to do this, and so she gave him her blessing. After arriving on Main Street in Silver Plume, Keith looked up and he saw KP Cafe off to the right. It was a weathered old building that looked like it was straight out of a You know what I just thought about when I heard that, man? Is that back in the day, in like the 1900s and, you know, whatever, man, the fucking... Just just back in the day, the, like those old, old, old ass towns where there was no cell phone, there was no telephone. The only thing I can ever think about is, especially when Mr. Ballin just said that his wife gave him a blessing, you know, and then he went or whatever. The only thing I think about is you can have a completely different life just down the road, like just literally a, a block away, a town away. A, a house, a wife, some kids, like, and no one would know. Like, you can't even change your damn name back in the day, and no one would think twice of it. No one would know. Like, you can go down the street, have a whole wife, husband, kids, just, just a pretty little life, and be the next town over, be George or some shit. Like, it, like... Back in the day, it was crazy. Like, I don't know. That's all I ever think about. Every time I hear things like that, that's all I ever think about. Like, imagine your wife being like, yeah, you can be gone for three months. But for that three months, you just in a whole nother town just with your other family. Like, she would never know because there's no, there's, there's no phones. There's no cameras. There's nothing. There's just locals, just people walking around just, hey, hey. Oh, yeah, that's George. He moved in three months ago. Like, like that's all I think about. <laughs> Cowboy movie, and this cafe was exactly the landmark that Keith had been looking for. And so he pulled his car over on the side of the road. He got out, he stretched, and then he began walking towards this cafe. This cafe was the big hangout spot in Silver Plume for all of its 140 residents. And the reason Keith knew this was because his best friend from high school, Ted Parker, owned KP Cafe. Ted had actually been the person who inspired Keith to come to Silver Plume in the first place. He had told him about how peaceful and serene this place was. 
the best environment for a writer. And when Keith had told Ted that that sounds great, I'm going to do it. I'm going to come to Silver Plume. Ted had told him that he also owned the store right next to KP Cafe that used to be a bookstore, but the previous tenant who ran the bookstore had talked about some big European vacation he was going on and then had just kind of vanished. And so for months now, this storefront had been vacant. And so Ted had told Keith that while he was in town, he was more than welcome to work and write out of this vacant bookshop. And so Keith, after walking up to the front window of KP Cafe, he looked inside and didn't see Ted, and so he decided he would take a moment and walk over to this vacant bookshop that would be his office. So he went next door, he pulled out the key that Ted had already sent him in advance, he unlocked the door, and he went inside. And right away, Keith was struck at what he saw. I mean, the place was full of books. Some piles of books were higher than his head, and many of the books looked rare and expensive. And Keith's first thought was, why did this guy who used to run the store just abandon all of this. This had to cost a lot of money. But Keith was far too excited about the next few months and getting this book done that he didn't really think too hard about whatever the previous owner had done. And instead, he just began to daydream about what the next few months would be like and how this book was going to turn out. And as Keith was thinking about his big book project, Ted actually came into the bookstore and when the two friends saw each other, they ran up to each other and embraced. And then before long, the two of them had gone outside and began walking around Silver Plume, just chatting and catching up. And eventually, after chatting and walking around for a really long time, the pair left Silver Plume and wound up walking onto this hiking trail that went up into the woods. Now, years earlier, Ted and Keith had both been avid hikers and outdoorsmen. But now, I mean, Keith had put on some weight and he really wasn't a big hiker anymore, but Ted didn't really know that. And so Ted, he's leading this hike up this trail as they're still kind of chatting and making light of things. But Keith, as he was struggling to keep up, was getting more and more anxious about this hike. And he also had a deep fear of heights. And this trail appeared to go really high up this mountain. But Keith kept telling himself that, you know, he was here in Silver Plume as much to write this book as he was to kind of have a little more adventure in his life. And so he just kept on trudging along after Ted. But eventually, Keith just could not handle how high up they were getting. He was totally terrified of being able to see the valley way down below. And so he had a sort of panic attack where he lunged and grabbed a nearby tree and hugged it like it was the only thing keeping him from falling off the mountain. And when Ted turned around and saw Keith, he rushed over to him and said, don't worry, everything is okay. He convinced him to let go of the tree. And then very carefully, Keith and Ted walked back down the trail back into town. And when they got down there, Ted would tell Keith he was so sorry for putting Keith in such a stressful position. And Keith kind of brushed it off and said, you know, it's totally fine, you know, no big deal. Even though this panic attack was very embarrassing for Keith, he wound up just kind of shifting his mental focus to getting settled into this new life he was going to be living for the next few months. And so along with this office space in this old abandoned bookstore that Keith would be using, he also rented a small apartment in the little church in town. And very quickly, Keith developed a sort of daily routine. He would get up early in his apartment and he would make his way over to the bookstore and he would sit down at his computer and he would write all day. But even though Keith was doing a lot of writing, it was not productive writing. It was mostly Keith sitting down trying to come up with the topic for his book not being able to do it, and then he just sort of drifted off and began doing journal entries and writing snippets of poetry, and then before long the day was over and he had accomplished nothing. And so at the end of June, roughly two weeks after Keith had arrived in town, he was sitting at his computer one morning inside of the bookshop, unable to write anything productive, and he told himself, you know what, I gotta do something to break out of this writer's block. Writer's block is when writers kind of hit a psychological wall and just can't seem to be creative, they can't write. And so Keith decided, in order to kind of get out of this funk, that he would go back up into the mountains again. He would face his fear of heights, and he would get to the summit, and that clean mountain air and all the nature around him would kind of bring him back to reality and give him the inspiration he would need to just write this book. And so Keith turned off his computer, he left the bookstore, he went back to his apartment in the church, he packed some sandwiches and some water into a backpack, 
and then he walked from the church apartment to the nearby trail that would lead out of Silver Plume and up into the forest and into the mountains. It was a hot day that day, but as soon as Keith was underneath the shade of all the trees, it was very cool, and the sounds of the birds and the insects and other animals all around him was very calming. But very quickly, Keith's hike went from very peaceful and relatively flat to very intimidating and very steep. But Keith, he was determined to do this hike. He felt like it was a critical step in the creation of this book. And so he just kept on going one foot after another, huffing and panting and making his way up this incredibly steep trail. And it was like with every step he took, he felt braver and braver. And suddenly he was able to look down at the valley below and not feel as frightened. And then at some point, as he was walking up, he saw all these scratch marks on a tree that were obviously from a mountain lion. But instead of Keith feeling scared, he felt more brave. He felt excited. He felt like this is what he came here for. This book and adventure kind of coming together in this moment. Finally, Keith made it to the top of this trail and he found this incredible clearing that looked down over the town below. And in this clearing was a monument to a man named Clifford Griffin who had died at this exact spot a hundred years earlier. Yeah, Keith I wouldn't want to be up there. Back in 1887, when Silver Plume was a booming mining town, Clifford, who was a mine owner, came up to this exact spot in the mountains to play his violin. And then after playing it for a bit, he stopped and dug a grave, stood on the edge of it, shot himself, and fell into the hole. What the fuck? No one knew why he did that. How does Mr. Balling get this information? Like... That is crazy. First of all, digging your own grave. Wild. Like, knowing, you know, you're going into that. Like, this is for me. Like, this is mine. I'm going to finish this. Is just crazy to me. Like... But within a couple of years, the mining industry came to a halt in Silver Plume and everybody just kind of vanished. And very quickly, rumors began to swirl around the people who remained in Silver Plume, how, you know, their town must be cursed. And maybe it was connected to what happened to poor old Clifford. After staring at this monument for a few minutes, Keith turned his attention to lunch. He pulled off his backpack, took out a sandwich, and he began eating. And as he ate, he looked back at this monument and he thought of another strange Silver Plume story, except this one hit much closer to home. It was about the man who used to run the bookstore where Keith now did all of his writing out of. This man's name was Tom Young, and it would turn out what Keith had heard about Tom when Keith first arrived in Silver Plume was not entirely correct. You know, Keith had been told that Tom had been talking about this European vacation, and so the consensus was that, you know, he had left town and gone to Europe and just not come back. But the reality was, once Keith began asking around a little bit over those first couple of weeks he was there, was that Tom actually had been talking about this big European vacation, but then had walked into the woods up into the mountains where Keith was right now, where this monument was, and Tom had just vanished apparently in these mountains. Tom apparently had been a very quirky guy who had come to Silver Plume in the 1970s to kind of start a new life for himself. He had been teaching high school students in Denver, but he apparently didn't really like doing that and wanted to start over, and so that was what drew him to Silver Plume. And in Silver Plume, residents always saw Tom, along with his best friend, Gus, his black Labrador retriever, walking around town playing fetch. But instead of using a ball, Tom would throw a chewed up doll's head. And then on September 7th, 1987, so roughly nine months before Keith arrived in Silver Plume, Tom and his dog Gus had gone for a hike in the woods where Keith was and then vanished. Now, at first, people assumed that because Tom had been talking a lot about going on this European vacation right before he vanished, that that must be where he went. Shit. But when people checked his shop, they saw all of his books were still in there. It did not appear like he had packed things up. And when the sheriff looked into it, he couldn't find any evidence that Tom had ever bought any plane tickets to go to Europe. And so no one really knew what happened to Tom. It was like this big mystery. And so as Keith was standing in this clearing near this monument, thinking about Tom and his story, Keith began to realize there were a lot of similarities between him, Keith, 
and Tom. And they both, as adults, alike. had come to Silverplume, this kind of random place in the middle of Colorado, to get a sort of second chance in life. And they both worked out of the exact same storefront. And Keith had done some additional digging on Tom when he heard about this mystery and learned that they were almost the exact same age. Their birthdays were separated by one day. Also, Keith discovered that he and Tom had served in the military at almost the exact same time in the 1960s. Oh, that's the same person, so for sure. as Keith was going over all these strange coincidences and weird similarities between his life and Tom's, suddenly Keith stopped chewing his sandwich and just quickly packed everything back up. He turned and began running down the trail, going back towards town. And as he ran, Keith smiled because he realized he had just discovered what his great American classic novel was going to be about. It was going to be about Tom. For the entire month of July, all Keith did was write. He was in his office seven days a week typing away, and then at night when he went back to his apartment, his neighbors would see the lights on all night long. At the end of July, so by this point, Keith has been living in Silverplume for about a month and a half, two hunters from Silverplume began hiking up that same mountain trail that led up into the mountains and into the forest that Keith had gone on recently and found his inspiration for his novel. And so these two hunters, they're making their way up the trail, and at some point they leave the marked trail and begin kind of meandering through the trees. And as they're walking, they're kind of looking for a clearing to set up for the day. And at one point, one of the hunters happens to look up and he sees there's this really bright white thing sitting at the base of a tree in a clearing. And so these two hunters make their way up to this bright white thing. And as soon as they're looking down at it, they realize they have very likely stumbled on a crime scene. At their feet was this green tarp that was partially exposing this white skeleton underneath. And when they pulled back the green tarp a little bit, they saw it was a human skeleton and a dog skeleton kind of lying next to each other as if the two of them had lied down and died there. But what was immediately apparent to these two hunters is that both the human skull and the dog skull had gaping holes in them, like they had been shot. And several feet away from the skeletons was a rusted pistol. And so these two hunters, after staring at the scene in front of them for a couple of seconds, they took a mental note of where they were on the mountain, and then they turned around and headed back down to town to tell the sheriff. And when the sheriff went up with his deputies to go search the scene themselves, they very quickly identified that these remains belonged to Tom Young and his dog Gus. And the sheriff also found out that that pistol that was found several feet away from the two skeletons had been purchased by Tom just a few days before he had vanished. And so the sheriff decided that what must have happened is Tom brought his dog up into the mountains and after shooting his dog, Tom turned and shot himself. This was a suicide case closed. But this explanation didn't make any sense to the people of Silverplume. First of all, Tom loved his dog Gus. Gus was basically like his child because Tom didn't have any other family. And so why would he hurt his dog? Mm. Also, Tom was not acting remotely like someone who was going to commit suicide in the days leading up to his death. People saw him at the grocery store buying a whole bunch of groceries. He talked endlessly about how excited he was about this big European vacation. And then there was this one other thing that also made suicide seem very unlikely. When those two hunters had discovered Tom and Gus, they were partially covered by that green plastic tarp. But it looked very much like the wind and kind of nature in general had blown the tarp off of them, revealing the white bones that the hunters had seen. But what that meant is that very likely that tarp at one point Was had been totally there. covering yeah. their bodies. And so between that and the fact that the gun was located several feet away from where Tom was, it seemed to the people of Silverplume that probably somebody else had shot and killed both Tom and Gus, covered them up with this tarp, and then dumped the gun several feet away. Adding to the theory that this was a murder, not a suicide, were the rumors around town that there was this nuclear weapon production facility somewhere near their town, and apparently they were illegally dumping radioactive materials into these old abandoned mine shafts near and in Silverplume. And people thought, you know, maybe Tom, who had military training, he was actually in the special forces in the military, maybe he had gone out and done some snooping around and discovered this illegal dumping operation, and that got him killed. 
When Keith heard that Tom and Gus's bodies had been discovered up in the mountains, it was absolutely devastating for Keith. Even though Keith had never actually met Tom, he still felt like he had a bond with Tom. I mean, he was obsessively writing about Tom and learning everything about him, and he also had all these similarities with Tom, and so it was a really big deal to find out that Tom and Gus were dead. But the silver lining to this tragedy was that Keith was now armed with more information about Tom and his dog, and suddenly the ending to his big novel became clear. And so Keith got right back to work. On August 3rd, 1988, so a couple of days after Tom and Gus's skeletons were found up in the mountains, the town of Silverplume held a memorial service for Tom. And Keith, he would attend the service, and as he listened to the people of Silverplume talking about Tom and how he had come to Silverplume to get this second chance at life, Keith couldn't help but feel like it was almost like he was watching his own memorial service because Tom's life so closely mirrored his own. And then as he was listening to more and more people talk, Keith started to feel like there was no way Tom killed himself. That can't be what happened. Something else happened to Tom. And Keith was confident that through his research and through doing this book about Tom, he would figure out what happened to him and his dog. As soon as the memorial service ended, Keith quickly slipped out and headed back to his apartment. And when he went inside, he looked around at all the stacks of papers and maps and books that he was using to put together this novel. And he knew that out of all this chaos around him, this novel really was becoming a thing. He was doing it. He was going to get this book done. But he knew there was one more thing he had to do before he could finish this book. And that was, he had to go back up into the mountains. So a few days later, on August 7th, at around 4.30 in the afternoon, Keith walked inside of KP Cafe and strolled up to the counter where his buddy, Ted Parker, was sitting there reading a book. Keith paid for a drink and then announced to Ted that he, Keith, was going to leave this cafe and go right up into the mountains again. And so as Keith told Ted his big plan for this hike he was gonna go on, Ted just felt totally confused. Ted's looking at Keith knowing this guy is not a confident climber. I mean, they had gone on that one hike partway up the mountain and Keith had had a panic attack and had to go back down again. Also, at the top of the mountain, it was like 12,000 feet of elevation where the temperatures would be near or below freezing. And here Keith was just wearing a flannel shirt and jeans. He had no other equipment with him, no other warm clothes. Also, the route that Keith was describing to Ted would take at least six hours round trip. And it's 4.30 nope. p.m. now. And so Ted's thinking, you know, Keith is going to get trapped up in the mountains in the middle of the night. And so Ted finally says to Keith, I hope you're joking. But Keith would say, I am not joking. And in fact, I'm leaving right now. And then before Ted could even protest, Keith turned around and while sipping his drink, just casually walked out of the store and began heading towards the mountains. And Ted, you know, he thought about stopping Keith and really talking some sense into him and getting him not to do this hike. But ultimately, Ted decided to do nothing. And he told himself that he would just check on Keith the next day. And so the next morning, Ted, instead of going to his cafe, went first to the bookstore next door to see if Keith was in there. But when he got to the door, it was clear Keith was not inside and the door was locked and everything was dark. And so trying not to panic, Ted hopped right back into his car and he drove over to the church apartment where Keith had been staying. But again, Keith was not there. And right away, Ted is like, oh my goodness, Keith is stuck up on the mountain right now. Exactly what I thought was gonna happen has happened. And so right away, Ted rushed to the sheriff to tell him that Keith was missing. And after hearing what Ted had to say, the sheriff would end up launching one of the biggest search and rescue efforts in the history of Colorado. Within 24 hours of being informed of Keith's absence, there were hundreds of people, professional searchers and just locals who wanted to help combing this mountain trail looking for Keith. There were planes overhead, there were tracking dogs. I mean, this was a really big deal. And by this point, Keith was very well known in Silverplume. It's a tiny place. Everybody knows each other and everyone knew that, you know, he was working on this big book. And so people were really worried about Keith. He was one of theirs. But also the townspeople were very creeped out by the fact that, you know, Keith, who they knew was very similar to Tom. They knew he was writing about Tom. They knew that Keith was working out of the same storefront that Tom had been in. 
that now Keith had apparently vanished under the exact same circumstances as Tom. He had wandered into the woods and that was it. And so it just felt like how could they have these two people go missing in the exact same way? It just wasn't adding up. On August 9th, so two days after Keith had gone missing, and so by this point he's still missing, Ted and some friends decided they would go to Keith's apartment and look around and see if maybe there was some clue as to where Keith went or what he was going to do on this hike. And so they went into his apartment and Ted's friends began fanning out and looking in the bedroom and looking through all the papers and documents all over the floor. And Ted sat down at Keith's computer. And so Ted fired it up. And as soon as it loaded, there was just this one document on the desktop. And it was the book that Keith was writing. And so Ted clicked on it. And right away, after reading just a couple of lines, he was yelling for his friends to come over here and look at this. And one by one, each of these guys came over and they just could not believe what they were looking at. From the first page of Keith's book, it was clear the setting for his book was Silver Plume, except he renamed it White Plume. He had created all these fictional characters as well that were obviously based on real people, but had renamed them as well. But that was not what shocked Ted and his friends. What shocked them was the main character of this book. His name was Guy Gypsum. Guy Gypsum was a military veteran who had come to White Plume looking for a better life and an opportunity to be closer to nature in rural Colorado. Guy was almost 50 years old, he loved to go hiking, and he worked out of a storefront that was right next to the only cafe in town. Guy Gypsum was both Keith and Tom at the same time. Keith basically had taken Tom's life and Keith's own life and merged them to create this composite character. And when Ted and his friends scrolled to the bottom of this document, they realized that Keith had written an ending for Guy Gypsum's character. Suicide. These are the final words in this document. Guy Gypsum changed into some hiking boots and donned a heavy flannel shirt. He understood it all now and his motivations. Guy closed the door and then walked off towards the lush, shadowless Colorado forests above. Five days later, the search for Keith was called off. He was never found. Some people say Keith wandered up into the mountains and accidentally died of exposure and someday will find his remains somewhere in the forest. But others say, after reading that final line in Keith's book, that Keith did all this on purpose. I mean, he literally lived out the final part of That's his what book. I would say, he put yeah. on his boots and his heavy flannel shirt and his jeans, and he wandered off into the lush, shadowless Colorado forest above and killed himself in order to perhaps get closer to Tom Young, the man he had kind of become obsessed with after learning they were so similar, and the man he kind of like meshed his own life with and created this weird composite character of these two lives. I mean, it seemed like a guy that had kind of spiraled into madness in writing this book and decided that death was the only way to finish the novel. And still right. others say, you know, maybe there really is some kind of secret illicit operation happening in or around Silver Plume. Maybe it's that radioactive waste getting dumped into the mines that, you know, Tom discovered and that got him killed. And Keith, in researching Tom, also discovered this illegal thing and that got Keith killed as well. But all of those things are just theories because today, officially, there is no answer as to what happened to Keith. His case is still open. Wow. That's crazy. So that's going to do it. If you enjoyed today's episode. Ah. All right, relax here. Now that's actually wow. Cold case. Literally. That's, that's, that, that's tough. That's tough, man. Uh, man, but we going to end this live here, man. Shout out to everybody that was in the chat. Shout, uh, shout out to you, Amber. For, uh, becoming a member you know this has been fun and like I said I probably will be going live more at night now because you guys said you know you're down for it so that's all I needed was a green light from you guys man but thank you guys for everything man and I'll see you guys next time peace